Energy issues seem to challenge us more and more each day. Refining in particular plays a critical role in supply and demand issues and remains a vital component of our energy infrastructure. You're here today because you either work for an energy or energy related organization or you're simply fascinated with the subject of petroleum refining. <laughs> no matter, I am proud to be of service to everyone who finds themselves in a world with its own special language. In this world, you are surrounded by familiar words like crude oil and natural gas, and not so familiar words like algae plants, cat reformers, and cokers. There may even be some of you uncertain of the difference between a cat cracker and a Ritz cracker, <laughs> but that's what we're here to find out. In reality, the refining and energy industries are extremely intriguing, with a remarkable history to match. Until the advent of the gasoline engine in the 19th century, people used petroleum products for what we now consider basic needs, lighting, heating, cooking, and lubricating. When Colonel Edwin Drake drilled the first commercial oil well in 1859 to a depth of 69 feet in Titusville, Pennsylvania, his investors were thrilled. Why wouldn't they be? They saw the opportunity to compete with whale oil in the illumination market by supplying a similar product, kerosene. At the time, gasoline and naphtha were considered waste products and often were burned in pits or allowed to evaporate into the atmosphere before the kerosene was recovered. It didn't take long, however, for early day refiners to discover that the heavier parts of the crude oil could be used as fuel oil for raising steam or heating buildings. For 30 years after the discovery of crude oil, refining consisted of separating these various products by batch processing, a tedious process by all accounts that involved heating and vaporizing one tank of oil at a time and a condenser that returned the vapors to a liquid state. Fractional distillation, using the trade columns now used worldwide, didn't come into play until the 1920s. Fractional distillation had been used for nearly a decade to distill alcohols. Yes, the same kind you might enjoy with a cocktail olive or a twist of lemon. Shortly after the Prohibition Act of 1920, many of the technologists from the spirits industry found themselves suddenly out of work. By bringing their distilling expertise to the refining industry, the efficiency of separating crude oil increased by 25%. But the true turning point in the evolution of petroleum refining was inarguably the invention of the internal combustion engine, an innovation that required a lighter fuel, gasoline. By 1910, some half million cars traveled U.S. roads, and the demand for gasoline exceeded even the volumes that were previously burned or left to evaporate into the atmosphere. But running more crude oil to satisfy the growing demand for gasoline also created surpluses of the non-gasoline fractions. Chemical engineers then realized they could convert some of the heavier parts of crude oil by cooking it until it cracked into the lighter fractions. Although Vladimir Shukov is credited with patenting the thermal cracking process in 1891, Amico brought the first American cracker on stream in 1912 in Chicago. Amico's chief scientist, William Burton, took the victory lap for bringing online one of the most important breakthroughs in refining history, the cracker. Over the decades, a number of other inventions would continue to transform the refining process, many of them driven by the automobile industry and later by environmental mandates. Some of these included the search for higher octane gasoline to satisfy the higher compression ratios in cars. Chemists of General Motors discovered in 1921 that adding small amounts of lead compounds to gasoline significantly improved its octane number. But tailpipe lead emissions were later proven to pollute the environment, so lead was phased out in the 1970s. The introduction of catalytic crackers in 1936 essentially doubled the volume of quality gasoline from heavy feedstocks compared to earlier thermal crackers. The first catalytic reformer in 1949 improved the octane number of the naphtha already being blended into gasoline, which helped satisfy the demand by the auto industry for more energy efficiency. 
hydro processing and in particular hydro treating to remove contaminants became increasingly important in the latter half of the century as the nation's environmental consciousness awakened. Lastly, as environmental regulations and increasing crude runs drove down the price of residual fuel even further, refiners perfected the coker, which converted even more of the bottom of the barrel to gasoline than the thermal crackers. So there we have a quick history of refining and its evolution. It's important to understand that most of the technological change in the last 20 years has been prompted by environmental concerns, causing refiners to tweak existing processes rather than completely reinvent the wheel. Apparently, social pressure is the mean stepmother of change. But even after all that, the five basic processes of refining remain the same. They include separation, cracking, reshaping, combining, and treating. Let's have a look at each. Separation, mostly by distillation. Here the molecules remain intact and no chemistry takes place. This is the only process of the five that has no chemistry associated with it. In other words, the molecules going in are the same as the molecules coming out. They just end up in different buckets. Cracking, with or without catalysts, with or without hydrogen to break apart large molecules into smaller ones, as in cat cracking, hydro cracking, and coking. Reshaping essentially changes the configuration of individual molecules, as in cat reforming and isomerization. Combining makes larger molecules from smaller ones so they can be used in gasoline, as in alkylation and polymerization. Treating uses catalysts and other agents to chemically remove contaminants. You with me? Good. Now let's go for a ride. It's always a good idea to know something about the raw materials before thinking about how to transform them into finished marketable products. This is what is commonly referred to as the oil patch, where the raw materials of refineries, or hydrocarbons, are brought up from under the earth. Raw materials from the oil patch have colorful but not necessarily descriptive names. Crude oil, condensate, natural gasoline, natural gas liquids, liquefied petroleum gas. Fact is, the underground accumulation of hydrocarbons, that is, combinations of hydrogen and carbon atoms, can be found in several forms. Let's take a look at a few of them. Almost every oil reservoir has some gas dissolved in the oil, sometimes substantial amounts. Conversely, almost every gas reservoir has some oil dissolved in it. Sometimes a well can tap an oil formation that is topped by a gas cap, like that at Prudhoe Bay in Alaska. Let's take a look at an oil reservoir. As an oil stream comes up out of the reservoir and out through the wellhead, the pressure drops. The oil and previously dissolved gas mixture goes into a vessel right at the well site called a field separator. As the gas and liquid enter the larger space, the beer bottle effect occurs. The pressure drops further and the light gases that were dissolved in the crude oil vaporize and bubble out, just like the fizz in a beer when you pop the top. Natural gas is drawn off the top of the separator and the crude oil out the side. Almost every reservoir has water vapor entrained in the oil and gas. Almost all this water vapor separates in the field separator. Now, let's look at a gas reservoir. As we discussed earlier, almost every gas reservoir also has some oil dissolved in it. When the gas from the wellhead goes through a field separator, the heaviest hydrocarbons drop out in the form of liquids called condensate, which is like a very light crude oil. In the case of an oil and gas accumulation, the gas cap may be untapped for decades to maintain the pressure needed to push the crude oil out of the reservoir up the borehole. When the crude oil is substantially evacuated, then the gas can be harvested. The basic constituent of natural gas is methane, but even when natural gas goes through a field separator, 
some of the hydrocarbons heavier than methane can still remain in the vapor stream. Some of these natural gas liquids, or NGLs, can be left in the natural gas, but other NGLs can create operational problems downstream if not removed in a natural gas plant, especially butane and natural gasoline. There are also economic incentives to remove NGLs at a gas plant. These streams may be worth more in other markets than being sold as constituents of natural gas. Let's take a look at these natural gas liquids and how they are used. Ethane goes to chemical plants where it is used as feedstocks for ethylene. Propane, which is often called liquefied petroleum gas, or LPG, is an industrial and consumer NGL used for heating, lighting, and cooking, or in chemical plants as feedstocks for making ethylene. Butanes usually go to gasoline blenders or refiners as raw material or chemical plants for feedstocks. In some places, butanes are used together with propane as LPG. Natural gasoline is a low-octane, gasoline-like material that you wouldn't want to use by itself in your car. This NGL is either blended with other higher-octane blending components or goes to chemical plants as feedstocks.